I love your studios. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, like I said it, it's being torn down right now. I'm actually moving from Seattle, from the West Coast to Miami uh, mm -hmm. next week. So everything's kind of coming down, and I'll rebuild it all back on uh, in Miami. So okay, let's get it started. Uh, hello, John. Welcome to Poker World. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You have an impressive background uh, with big roles at uh, uh, Seismic Games and Activision Blizzard. So mm -hmm. what made you want to move from uh, the uh, industry, uh, from the Web2 gaming industry into blockchain gaming? And uh, you could share uh, with us about the story and the vision behind uh, the creation of Miser's Chain. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so yeah, I've been we've been at this for a little while now. Uh, so as you mentioned, I was you know originally came from kind of PC console industry um, at Activision Blizzard, mostly on the Call of Duty franchise. Uh, a couple other groups there as well. We we worked on Skylanders. We actually were partnered up with Tencent for Call of Duty Online as well for a while. Uh, left there and had a had a company called Seismic Games, which is predominantly focused on mobile. Uh, we also did a little bit of new content as well, or new new formats. Uh, we we did a, a Blade Runner game in VR, early early VR days. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a couple games uh, in VR, and uh, we also built the Millennium Falcon ride for Disneyland and Disney World. So we got to do kind of live, like a live gaming experience uh, with Star Wars as well. So we got to do a lot of great things. And when we sold that company to Niantic that made Pokemon Go, we I was really thinking about. Uh, kind of this concept, right? And actually at Seismic, we were actually working on a kind of an early prototype of what could be a blockchain game. This is back in 2016, 2017. So right as kind of CryptoKitties was coming out. And in fact, the, the prototype was called Mythimals, which was these little mythological mammals. And, mm -hmm. um, and basically that was kind of the idea originally was we were thinking a lot about kind of blockchain and what the concept of digital ownership meant for consumers. And I, I felt like I was really, really excited by the concepts. I felt like it was also very, very difficult for consumers mm -hmm. to understand, but I, I could see where that was going. So when I sold the company, when we sold the company to Niantic, I really wanted to do this full time. So hence the name Mythical kind of came from Mythimals, a uh, game we were working on. But, uh, um, you know, I really love this concept of what we could do and what does decentralization play into gaming, right? Gaming is this massive, massive industry, but it's still controlled by a very small few groups that kind of control the ecosystems. And I really believe that we're, we're heading to a 3D internet over time mm -hmm. and, and gaming will probably lead a lot of those charges. So 3D internet, metaverse, whatever you want to call it. But we really think that that's the future. And I think the only way to truly pull that off in a global, uh, global economy is through decentralization and blockchain. So we've been thinking about it a lot, but I think we've been trying to come at it a little bit different angle than other groups have. We've been really coming at it in terms of how do we take concepts of Web3 and bring them into gaming? So it always, to us, has to start with gaming and interactive worlds first. And how do those basically pieces affect uh, those those uh, virtual worlds? Yes. And can you explain us about more about the how, you know, <laughs> the how part? Blockchain, industry, uh, blockchain technology, you know, is really different from yeah. the... Web two technology. So, uh, yep. so how it changes the gaming industry, and yep. what unique benefits does it offer to developers and players? Yep. So, so you know, I've gotten this question a lot too, or also just why Web three, right? <laughs> Could you do this in Web two? And and I do think there's parts of it you can do in Web two, right? I mean, Roblox in the U.S. has done it, you know, pretty successfully, having kind of marketplace type functionality. Um, you know, Epic's looking at doing things. Steam has had a version of that. But the, at the end of the day, those are very closed off ecosystems, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they do have a lot of consumers and a lot of brands and creators will build into those markets just because they have a lot of consumers. But at the end of the day, I think that to truly have a global kind of creator economy or economy that you can really have ownership, it does have to be open. you know. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it can be down to uh, one person deciding, you know what, we're going to uh, you know, change that revenue share for everybody. We're going to change mm -hmm. how these assets work. And I don't think we're still fully there yet in Web3, but I think Web3 gives you that promise, right? It lets us start building together. And I think that's that's what we've been seeing already. You know, we've seen our first game, Blancos. We started seeing the, the, the beginnings of that creator economy, right? We had artists from around the world that were creating these little characters in game, and it was their kind of creation, right? They submitted them, we put them in the game. 
but they earned the money off of them. Uh, brands started getting involved. We had a lot of different brands from, you know, in, in, in Japan, we had Toho Digital and, and artists like Junko Mizuno. We had uh, EDM artists like Dead Mouse and Burberry and, and, and Pop-Tarts, the uh, cereal bars. They all kind of were able to build into this world. So we kind of started seeing that first part of what a creator economy could be. I think what we've seen next was our game NFL Rivals, which is kind of American football with these, you know, tradable assets, right? And I think what we what we discovered there that was really exciting is that one, we can actually blend these Web three concepts into a mainstream game and have it in a in a form that gamers will accept. And I think that's really important. Is you know, you hear a lot that gamers hate NFTs, and frankly, there's a lot of NFTs I hate. I, there's a lot of those projects I don't think are very interesting either. I think they're very scammy. But I think what we've seen is that we've been able to blend those concepts into a real game with 5 million people in the game and it's working. You know, we're building that economy. It's growing every single day. We're hitting mm-hmm. even during the off season. So right now, you know, the Super Bowl is in February for NFL. So we have mm-hmm. a few months until the season starts again, but it's still growing month over month, which is really exciting to see. So, mm-hmm. so I think we've been able to kind of understand that. And I think the last thing that we've really done differently is most of these kind of NFT marketplaces, they treat everybody like traders, right? There's bids and asks and floor prices and collection values. And that's not really how gamers necessarily think, right? Gamers think in terms of liquidity. If you look at every video game for the last 20 years in a player to player economy, it was traditionally set up with two panels. This is what I want and this is what I'm willing to give you. And I think that's been a concept we've been able to bring that concept of Web3 into this world of how gamers trade assets. And it's been really, really fun to see. So we just rolled some of this stuff out and it's been super, super successful. We've seen a lot of players that are getting involved. Um, and uh, we can see the mystical chain, uh, mystical game is very successful on Ethereum chain and it's super, super successful. So, <laughs> and uh, uh, so why, why you move from the Ethereum chain to Polkadot parachain? So yeah. is there some strategic reasons strategic or technical reasons for this move yeah. and how it is how it helps your gaming ecosystem yeah that's a great question so as i mentioned before I, I really believe that for this economy to work worldwide it does have to be open and i'll even admit some of the first things that mythical did i don't think we're very open right we were trying to bring these concepts into the world of gaming but we all are also are working with the app stores and things like that so there's been a lot of things that we had to do that were still closed you know, and in fact, our old chain was a permission side chain. So sure, it was it had some of the properties of Web3, right? It was it was transparent. Uh, there was a block explorer. It was immutable, all those types of things. But it, I felt like we felt like it wasn't still a true open system. And I think so we started thinking about it worked fine. It actually works great right now. But we wanted to take it further, right? We wanted to give players the concept of ownership, but do it in a very protected, safe way. So we started off with our mythical chain, and now we are looking for a partner of how do we actually take that to what we think will become fully decentralized over time. And so we helped found kind of the Mythos Foundation. The Mythos Foundation launched the Mythos token. There's now 23 different companies that have joined the Mythos Foundation, groups like Square Enix um, and Bandai Namco and groups like that in Japan. There's groups like uh, Krafton out of Korea has joined, uh, Sega out of Japan has joined, We've had a lot of, um, you know, Ubisoft from France. A lot of these companies around the world have kind of joined Mythos to help see what we can build. And I think that's been very exciting. Um, so, so that was kind of step one. And step two was to kind of rebuild that Mythos chain to where it's no longer a mythical chain, right? It's, it's, a, it's a chain that we're, we don't own. It's a chain that's really run by this foundation. It's run by the DAO and, and bring all of what we built to that new chain. And I think Polkadot does a couple things for us. One, it's by far the most decentralized product in the world, I think. You know, I, I, maybe besides Bitcoin, right? But I mean, in terms of building apps, I think it's the most decentralized structure. And it does a lot of things really, really well in this decentralized um, ecosystem. So we love that. We love that, frankly, that we could actually build or the DAO could essentially build whatever functionality we wanted into our own version of our chain, the Mythos chain. So the DAO can decide rules, right? It can change protocol fees. It can add staking. It can do all of those things, but it's still secured by the Polkadot relay chain. And that's exciting when you can kind of be able to build as a DAO, 
but have the power of, of, uh, of, a, of a very decentralized network. We thought that was really exciting. So those are some of the, the key things we are looking for. It's also led, though, for us to start doing new things. So our chain is now live. Uh, we actually today, uh, this is good timing, we actually had the first tokens move from ERC to Substrate today. So just a few hours ago, we had the first bridging happen through the snow bridge. So that's exciting to see. Uh, we'll have the DEXs up very quickly. We're already integrated into the wallet. So the ecosystem has been very supportive of Mythos so far, which is awesome. We're starting to see that chain live. And within a several weeks, we'll actually have a lot of that start migrating. So we have about 800,000 wallets on our current chain. Those will all be probably migrated in the next week or two. And then all of our marketplace tech and all of our games will be using that new chain very soon. So we're excited about that. We're excited about what the ecosystem can bring um, from Polkadot to Mythical <coughs> and Mythos in general. And we're excited to where that goes next. You know, we're not just thinking about GameFi. We, uh, we've been thinking a lot about SocialFi, right? How does SocialFi affect games? How does Dpen kind of affect uh, cloud gaming, things like that? So we think that the Polkadot ecosystem and more importantly, the, the Mythos chain is really built in a way now that many companies can build, many companies can contribute, but it's built on the security and the decentralization of the Polkadot ecosystem. Yes, a security, decentralization, and uh, the governance, right? Governance, yes. And yeah, the governance, honestly, it's uh, it's funny. I, I, you hear a lot of things about Polkadot, and they're like, oh, the UI is not so great and all that. And and there's some good points. Some of the older UI is really not good. Um, mm -hmm. Polkadot.js extension is one of the worst you know kind of experiences I've had. But one of the best experiences I had have been a group like Nova Wallet or even Talisman, right? Uh, those are very, very intuitive for consumers. It's very easy to do. And we're building with those two companies in particular. We're also talking to SubWallet as well to build very integrated experiences, right? So if I want to swap a token, if I want to bridge a token, if I want to stake a token or vote on governance, you can do it right from the wallet. And that's something that Polkadot does really, really well. I just don't think a lot of the world has seen it yet. Mm -hmm. And I think my uh, Mrs. Tree already benefit from the uh, the the open gov, right? Yeah. Because uh, we noticed that uh, Mrs. Tree swapped uh, some token, yeah. or, uh, swapped some some dots from Treasury yeah. uh, for yes, airdrops sir. to to the community. So can you give us an update on when the airdrop token will be given to users, and once they got these tokens, what can they do with them? Yeah. So, uh, well, about the time of this, you know, when this when this goes, this information gets out, um, we'll probably have that that token swap done uh, very quickly. So, I say the the we've been waiting on that bridging to happen, which actually again happened today for the first time. We are also then looking at um, once the tokens can be uh, migrated in, right? They can be bridged into the chain because we're not building a new token. We're taking the existing token and let you bridge it to the new chain. So now that that's go, uh, going live and we'll have a lot more of that bridging in in the next few days, um, we can now do, now we can now execute that token swap. So we will get the the million dot for the myth, all that type of stuff. That'll happen soon, and and once that happens, then frankly, it's on the it's on the polka dot side to actually complete that airdrop. So we're not we're not really responsible for that airdrop, but that's all happening very quickly, which is exciting. So so I'd say we're in a matter of weeks now. All of that will happen. And so what will happen on the Mythos chain, so we'll not only have 800,000 holders of Myth token, but we'll now have about 450,000 new holders of the Myth token as well. So we'll have nearly 1.2 million token holders on the new chain already. So that's pretty great for day one, but that is happening very quickly. We are working with a DAO in terms of trying to get a staking proposal out to try and get the new governance system up. There's a lot happening in the next few weeks, in addition to us migrating all of our marketplace tech over to the new chain as well. Yes, there's a lot of lot of things gonna happen in the in the few weeks, and uh, something already happened. That is your partnership with uh, with Pudgy Penguins. Yes. So, uh, what kind of game are you developing, and do you have uh, any early concept or plans to share? And will this be the first game launched on the my uh, stream? Yeah, so actually, uh, the, 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 we're bringing over two games already, right? So we'll be bringing over um, NFL Rivals will be on the, the Mythos chain very soon. And then Nitro Nation will also be on the Mythos chain very soon. Uh, we'll also then kind of, I don't know if you've heard, but we're moving Blancos from kind of the original PC game. And now we've been building a new mobile game for Blancos as well. So that'll be on the, obviously on the new chain as well. 
And now, now we have pudgy penguins. Uh, pudgy penguins is a really exciting opportunity. Um, I think it's one of the best Web3 branding projects I've, I've ever seen. I think what they've done with retail, what they've done with social has been absolutely phenomenal for any company, let alone a Web3 company, right? So I think Luke and team really know what they're doing. They've been able to build this community into millions of players. And I think what was exciting now, and I can't share too many of the details of the game yet, but it is kind of this fun collaborative cooperation or co-op type, you know, uh, competitive kind of nature. So it's kind of part co-op, part competitive. Uh, it's a mobile game. It's going to be a 3D game. Uh, we're really going to go deep into that pudgy, you know, pudgy world. And I think it's just going to be a really fun game for the community to play together. And I think that's the key that we're looking at. We also uh, will be releasing a lot of really interesting things around Web3. So I think not only this will this will this game with Pudgy be you know a, a very very successful mobile game, but it'll also um, oops, sorry I'm, I'm a little out of focus here. Let's get back <laughs> to focus. Okay, so so um, not only do I think it'll be a, a fun uh, mobile game, but I think it's going to be very innovative around a lot of the key Web three aspects. And I think the fact that they have this huge community in Web three, and we have have kind of the the experience to bring that game to mobiles millions of players on mobile will be the best of both worlds. Okay, I think mobile, you know, mobile games is very welcomed by users, more welcomed by the uh, computer games, right? Because it's very easy to to play, and you can just uh, play it on subway, on anywhere you can. Definitely, uh, yeah, I, I, we we love mobile just because. I mean, there's billions of players on mobile, right? It's literally billions of players on mobile. And I think that's exciting. I I, I love PC console as well. We're actually in discussion with some really really amazing PC console games coming to Web3 next year. So we're in talks with some of those. We're not ready to announce those yet. So so we're not, it's not that we're getting away from PC console, but what, what mobile does is it, it can literally move players into, you know, hundreds of millions of players, if not eventually billions of players in a game. Pokemon Go that bought, you know, they bought my last company, they had over 1 billion players, right? Mm -hmm. FIFA Mobile had over 500 million players, right? There's a lot of games that hit that level of players. And I think, um, I think that a game like a Pudgy Penguins, uh, along with what we can build together, I think we could get into tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of players over time. So, so I think it's a great market. It is very accessible. You have to design games a little different, but we've had a great experience and, and great uh, uh, kind of partnerships with Apple and Google to really allow us to bring a lot of that web functionality, Web3 functionality directly into the game itself. Yeah, it's amazing. And back to Mythos Chain. You know, we've heard about Mythers 2.0, but we never yeah. heard about uh, Mythers 1.0. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair what, point. What new, yeah, what new features or improvements does it bring uh, compared to Mythers 1.0? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of things. So when we when we first uh, launched launched uh, the, the foundation and helped to get that off the ground, you know, we, we thought about it very much from a gaming entertainment perspective. And I think we missed some of the Web3, to be real honest. You know, we had a lot of great companies that were all from the, the Web2 industry. And, and we were all coming together to do some great things, but but we, we were kind of missing some of the crypto side. So I think I think there's a couple things that are very, very different. One is the fact that it's more of a balanced uh, council now. So we're adding a lot more Web3 or crypto kind of native companies to Mythos now to, to make sure we, we really have an equal balance between gaming and Web3. So I think that's exciting. Just the focus is, is more kind of a hybrid between the two. Uh, the new Mythos chain, obviously, is, is a full L1, right? It's a full mm -hmm. decentralized L1. So the token and all that is actually going to be used on chain uh, on a mainnet, which I think is a big, big change. We're adding things like a protocol fee. So we're adding a protocol fee. So every single transaction that happens on the Mythos chain will basically have, will be subject to this protocol fee. And that protocol fee goes back into a staking pool, essentially where you can stake behind the validators and collators. So, so we're getting a lot more of the tokenomics, I think, right, in terms of what Mythos 2.0 can do. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we have a more balanced solution between gaming and Web3 with mm -hmm. Mythos 2.0. The governance and all that will be a much better and tighter experience than we've had before. We're looking at things like a staking protocol. There's a lot of things we're kind of looking at right now. And I think that's exciting. And I think already right after the governance, we're, we're not trying to do too many more proposals on the old chain and the old DAO. But as soon as the new governance is launched, I think you'll see at least four to six new companies that will apply immediately uh, for mm -hmm. kind of joining the Mythos, the Mythos ecosystem. So I think we're seeing a lot of, of kind of where that where that happens. 
Um, and, and I think Mythos 2.0, what we're calling it, is really the basis of all that coming together. Yeah, you've mentioned about the uh, gaming economy. So uh, uh, blockchain games often get criticized for their economic modules. <laughs> And so how does musical games uh, ensure a balanced and sustainable in-game in economy, avoiding problems like uh, hyperinflation or player ex exploitation? Yep. So, so I, th I think one, one thing that we're a little different than other groups is, is we, do, we do support the Myth token, right? The Mythos token is something we support, but also this, there's 21 other companies that own part of that token now. And they're gonna look. They're looking on how they could possibly support it as well. So that's 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 exciting. I, I really believe in the ecosystem tokens. Tokens that can be used across projects. Tokens that can have different utility for the same audience, right? So gamers and game developers, they're all trying to basically communicate with each other. And I think having an ecosystem token behind the scenes is really really powerful. Um, mm -hmm. What we don't believe in too much right now is single game tokens. There's a lot of game tokens that are just one token. And, and I have a hard time understanding that because I've, I've been fortunate to work on some very big games, but even the biggest games are supply and demand curves, right? So even if you take a game like World of Warcraft, it's had a great run, but at the end of the day, World of Warcraft was not backed by a military. It was not backed by oil reserves, right? It's just a video game. So at some point, if the supply and demand get out of sync, um, that token could could uh, um, you know could could fall pretty hard, and I think even if you put the proper sinks and faucets in it, I think it becomes very difficult to balance a game and build something long term. So what I do believe in though are the digital assets, the game items, the guilds, the game items, the things like that. That has natural value to consumers, right? If 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 you have anything that's time based, you can only get it for a certain amount of time, or you there's a quantity based. You have inherent value to consumers, right? They find value in those items the second they're gone. So the second they're gone, someone will find value in that. And to me, that's more exciting. That's that's a better model of, of how you can sustain an economy is, is built around these items. And frankly, what's great about it too is if you have a scarcity-based model or you have an unscarce uh, scarce model that feeds into a scarcity-built model, you can balance that right? You can do things like burning and crafting and, and all types of different things of how you can basically continue to balance that economy, um, but also let price indexes continue to stabilize, right? So, so that's, we've been focused more on assets than on tokens, but we have one token that we will use for everything we do. So as I mentioned before, we're thinking about GameFi, we're also thinking about SocialFi, we're mm -hmm. thinking about DPEN, and we want to use that same token across everything all these different permutations within the gaming industry. Yeah, there's a lot of concept in the blockchain uh, gaming, uh, the, the the tokens, the assets, the NFTs. Yeah. So do you think it is harder for um, for Web2 players to understand? It can be for sure, yeah. And I think it's also harder for game developers to build, uh, to build mm -hmm. a real game. It's tough, I mean, it's tough to build a, a Web2 game with a, with a virtual economy, building a game that, that has this kind of independent valuation by the community on these assets can be even more difficult. And, mm -hmm. and there's also rules that are more difficult, right? You can't just start mm -hmm. over. You can't just kind of take it away or, oh, oh, oops, we messed that up. Let's go back and kill all those assets and try it again. That doesn't really work. Once they're there, they're kind of out there. Now, now what you do with them, how you use them and how you create utility around them can shift. But the actual number of assets can can is pretty permanent, right? Because that's the whole concept of blockchain. So I think it's harder to build, but I do think we're seeing such amazing um, benefits of of what what we're seeing. And in fact, um, you know, when we first started NFL Rivals, the secondary uh, revenue from Web three was about fifteen percent of the entire game. So eighty five percent of the money came from kind of Web two, fifteen percent came from kind of the Web three components. Um, this this uh, last year we ended at about 24%. So it grew from about 15% to about 24% last year. Mm -hmm. um, this year we've seen months over 50%. So over mm -hmm. half the money is coming from Web3. And in fact, yesterday we had a record day for Web3 and 62% of all revenue came from Web3, right? So mm -hmm. it's from the Web3 components versus the Web2. So I think what we're seeing is that it becomes more and more important with time. So if you're building a game that has longevity and it has a mass market with a long period of time, you're going to see that web three contribute more and more and more into that economy over time. 
Mm. And what's the motivation of Web two players wanna play Web three games? Is, yeah. is it because they they, they can uh, you know they can get a lot of chance to get some token, or yeah. it is that they they, they are for fun? So so I think there's a gap for yes. for the main, mainstream adoption. So yep. what is what is it? Yep. Uh, you know, it's, that's a great question, Chris. And so, so I, I think a lot of people miss this in Web3 too. Everybody talks about it's profit, making profit in a game, right? And a lot of gamers, yeah, sure. There, there's going to be gamers that can, they're, they're going to want to make profit and they're going to try everything they can do to make profit. And that's fine. That's great. Uh, yeah, but, but what I think it's more about is kind of two things. One is I think it's about the idea of being entrepreneurial. It's the idea that I can do something and I can see the value of what I do, right? And that one kind of ties back to, I think, the bigger one, which is identity. And so what's really interesting is that in, in a game like NFL Rivals, if I suddenly get a rare, a really, really rare, we call them mythical cards, right? Mm -hmm. If I get a mythical card in the game, one, we never sell those cards ever. Um, they are only earned in the game or they're purchased from another player, right, in the secondary market. That's the only way to get these mythical cards. We never, you can never buy one from mythical, right? Um, so, so what's exciting about that is that um, those are the most sought after cards, right? And they're also usually the rarest. Um, what we see a lot though is, is let's say, let's say right now everybody talks about Travis Kelsey, you know, uh, Taylor, Taylor Swift's boyfriend, right? He plays for the Chiefs. Mm -hmm. His card is one of the most valuable in the game. And, and what's exciting is I think his card goes for like a thousand dollars in the secondary market. So a thousand US dollars in the secondary market. And what's, what's exciting about that is that a lot of people don't get that card and immediately sell it for a thousand dollars. What they do is they, they, and we hear this comment a lot. They're like, Oh, my collection just went up by a thousand dollars. Right? So the concept of web three, the concept of digital ownership, the concept of, of consumer priced and community priced uh, digital assets becomes part of identity. It becomes of, this is how good I am. Look, my collection just went up by this. Right? And it's not a game company dictating the value. It's it's this the community the uh, the worldwide uh, global economy is dictating what's the value of that asset right and to me that gets really exciting right and that is the types of principles that gamers love they love the idea that what they've been doing the time they've been spending in these worlds has become more valuable right it's not necessarily just about can I sell this and make a profit mm, that's great uh, looking ahead how do you see the future of gaming. Uh, in the context of Web3 and blockchain, what upcoming trends or technologies do you think will significantly impact the industry? Yeah, that's a great question as well. Um, so I think there's a couple of things we've been thinking about. Um, so, so one is obviously we want to see a lot more games. So I think, I think, you know, we're now seeing games in the millions of players. I think this year, you know, NFL rivals could actually hit 10 million players this year. So suddenly now we're hitting games in tens of millions of players. And I think next year we could see games in the hundreds of millions of players. So, so I think we're seeing um, big, big growth in these economies and what they can do. I think we're going to start seeing a lot more games coming from a lot bigger developers. And I, I already seen, I've seen some of my favorite game to, game makers in the world. Some of the people that were my idols in gaming and my friends in gaming, um, they're now building for Web three, right? And these guys mm -hmm. are amazing, amazing, like award winning game designers are now building with Web3 in mind. And I think that is awesome. So we're gonna start seeing better quality, more quality, more really strong games come out. But where does it go after that, right? So to me, again, it's not just marketplace. Um, to me, it's also, how do you think about social, right? One of the things we've always seen in gaming, whether it's Call of Duty or Blancos or NFL Rivals, no matter how many events and tournaments you put in a game, the community will always make their own right? They always will build their own tournaments. And sometimes they're using Google Sheets to track it and they're using Twitter to track it and things like that. But there's always this concept of, I want to throw a tournament, not just not just the game developer. And we've seen this forever. And I think, I think Web3 ends up opening up a lot of that. The social fi aspects of gaming, I think will come into that equation very soon. I think things like community tournaments and, and cross trading of assets, right? Not just trading within one game, but how do I do ecosystem trades and all that type of stuff, I think is coming very heavily, you know, tokenized guilds. I think that's part of social fi, right? Of how, where that, where does that happen and how does that play out? Right? So I think those things are really exciting. Um, as, as I think a lot of people know, we bought a company called Polystream 
and they have a very, very interesting cloud gaming solution. And I think that could be completely decentralized, right? So why not, why instead of having everything run through a handful of companies and a handful of cloud providers, why not let the community, the entire community, whoever wants to be part of that can host and can use these resources. So it kind of becomes this decentralized 3D internet over time. And I think, again, I think Web3 is the framework of how to make that happen. So I think, again, GameFi, SocialFi for games, and 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 Dpen, right, are all going to be big concepts for gaming. And it's something that we're working with Mythos and other mm -hmm. companies to kind of bring out. Yeah, what what's your take on the some trending words like AI combining with gaming? Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, you know, AI has been around for a long time, right? There's been things we've done in gaming that have have forms of AI. It really hasn't shifted. A lot of the neural net type algorithms haven't really shifted a ton since like the 1960s and 70s. Um, but what has shifted is the amount of compute power and the amount of data thrown into these models. And we're starting to see just absolutely revolutionary concepts coming out of it with the LLMs and the degener or, uh, generative AI. And, and it's really, really remarkable to see. And it's already affecting gaming in a big way. Uh, I think it's going to continue to go in a big, big way, right? So from how levels are designed, how, how interactions are formed, how characters are communicating with you, I think all of that will ultimately be very heavily influenced by AI, right? So gameplay itself and the world's the creation is going to be built by that. There's also AI is going to really have a major effect on production. So the biggest thing I always hear, and I think the biggest misnomer in gaming still, is this concept of interoperability, right? I can take a character out of one game and I can put them in another. There's a lot of reasons. I mean, technically the ownership can work now, right? Through through Web3, I can own this in one game and own it in another. The production is the issue, is you can't just take one asset and suddenly plug it into another world and say, make it work. Uh, there's no creative director of any major game I've ever met that would be like, yeah, just put that asset in my game and make it work. So everybody has a vision, right? They have an art style. And but what I do think is AI will lead to that, right? I own this item and I can help bring that same exact item into its own version in another world, right? So I think AI will have a lot of lot of focus around the gameplay aspects, a lot around the live op aspects, but also around the uh, the creation, you know, the production of assets, the production of game code, all that stuff will be will be driven by AI pretty heavily. You know, uh, Manta is also a trendy word in last year. Mm -hmm. How do you see the future with combining Manta with gaming? Are these the uh, same concept or they're just a different uh, gaming? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to answer that honestly. So, so um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I think they're, they're, you know, I don't, yeah, uh, I think are you talking like meta? Like, make sure I understand that the question is met, meta, meta, yeah, meta, metaverse, yeah. metaverse. So. That's a great, that's a great point. So metaverse to me is the most, it's one of the most frustrating words, I think, in gaming, <laughs> right? It really is. And and the reason is because some people think, oh, well, Roblox is the metaverse or Fortnite's the metaverse or Crossfire is the metaverse, right? Those aren't metaverses. Those are experiences, right? So to me, to me, the metaverse is, is a 3D internet, right? To me, it's not built on one engine. It's built on any engines, right? To me, the metaverse has to be done like the internet was, right? The 2D internet took off because it was open. I didn't write in one set of code. I didn't, you know, if right now, if I go to Microsoft.com, I'm on one programming language, right? .NET. I'm built, I'm running that from the Azure cloud and I'm using Microsoft payment rails. But I, as a consumer, can immediately go to Amazon.com in a split second and now I'm on C++ code running on AWS using Amazon pi uh, payment payment processing, right? And to me, that's why the internet took off, right? Is is because it was you, you were able to move between experiences and connect those experiences together. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that's what the metaverse is, but in 3D, right? When I can walk from one gaming world built on one game engine, and I can be in another gaming world on another game engine, um, I think to me, and they can be completely different engines, completely different companies, but when you can do that, then I think you have uh, what I consider a metaverse. And it's something that we've been spending a lot of time looking at, right? And we have some really interesting technology around portals and polystream to start doing that. It's not ready for production quite yet, but I think those are the types of things we think about. So 
Um, I think Metaverse is just a, an open 3D internet, um, but uh, no one's quite nailed it yet outside of, uh, you know, movies and, uh, and books and things like that so far. Okay. Uh, and thank you. I've learned tons of knowledge of gaming today, <laughs> but time is also very limited. And uh, I think we can keep in touch and keep posted. We can talk more in the future about Mather, Mather's game yep. uh, in progress or everything. And uh, so I think that that is the end of our interview today. And uh, may everything about you and uh, Mithers chain a great success. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Kristen. And I'd love to come back and share more soon. Mm, okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.